Good evening, all of you. Welcome to Enver Academy. It's really warm to welcome you all. So I hope everybody has written your uh, mock test today, the 11th uh, full portions again. For those who have done, I hope everybody has done it very well. So we have given certain questions given over here. So we'll see how can we solve these questions. And I would suggest you to uh, keep revising all the chapters that's given over here. Okay, yes. So the first question is given over here is when we homogenize any tissue in an acid, the acid soluble pool represents which of these is given over here. Okay. So what we will do, we will understand uh, what is this question says about. So when we homogenize, homogenize, we already know we are going to grind certain things. So we can take a living tissue, which can be any kind of animal tissues, or you can take any kind of plant tissues and what you're going to do, you're going to grind it, right? Yes. So when you're going to grind it, what exactly would have happened is we used to use trifluoroacetic acids. So we used to use trifluoroacetic acid. When you use trifluoroacetic acids, you will get uh, two things in the test tube. So as you already know, when you're going to keep on grinding, right? Yes. So you would be getting two things, which is going to be like, one is going to be the acid soluble pool. Another one is going to be the acid insoluble pool. So this one, right? This one, which is given over here, this is called as the acid soluble pool, right? Yes, this is going to be the acid soluble pool. And this one, suppose if I'm going to use any kind of uh, filters, right? Yes, if I use any kind of filters, what exactly happens? This is going to be the acid insoluble pool, which means they are going to be insoluble in the trifluoroacetic acids. So is it acid insoluble pools? The question is, when we homogenize any tissues given over here in the acid, the acid soluble pool, so this acid soluble pool usually have a molecular weight of, we can say like uh, 80 to 800 Daltons. Yes, so they have 80 to 800 Daltons. So we can take examples like sulfates, uh, phosphates, uh, vitamins, and then some kind of minerals and inorganic salts, all these things comes under this category. And if you see acid insoluble pool, acid insoluble pool, we can say nucleic acids and all larger molecules like polysaccharides, nucleic acids and proteins. And very importantly, it's going to be lipids. Even though lipids, the molecular weight is going to be 800 Daltons, since they are, when you're grinding it, what exactly happens is they become a vesicles, okay? So when they become vesicles, they would not be able to um, get filtered and through this filtering because they become a large molecules, right? Yes, even though the molecular weight is going to be 800 Daltons, we can say. The question is, when we homogenize any tissue in an acid, the acid soluble pool represents what? So is it going to have similar composition to that of a cytoplasm or cell membrane or nucleus or mitochondria. Whatever you're seeing here, you can see in a cytoplasm. So the answer for this question is going to be option A, right? Yes, so the answer is option A. Yes, so which of the following are not polymeric? So we can say polymeric is given over here. So we can say polymeric is going to be the polymers. So we know what's a polymer, right? We know what's a polymer. Polymer is usually going to be made up of lot of monomers, we can say. Yeah, so there's going to be a lot of monomers. So suppose let's take about proteins. Proteins are usually made up of lot of amino acids, right? Yes. So many amino acids combines together and they make up this protein. So they are ultimately going to be a polymer. And then if we have to see about this polysaccharides, polysaccharides are usually going to be combined together with the help of many monosaccharides. Like suppose if you take any kind of starch, if you take any kind of glycogens, if you take any kind of uh, cellulose, all of them are made up of glucose, right? But there's a difference in starch has amylose and amylopectins. So amylose usually have alpha D glucose and amylopectin has alpha D glucose. And the thing is, there's a difference in the bond. One is going to be alpha 1 comma 4 glycosidic bond and amylosis, and alpha 1 comma 4 and 1 comma 6 in amylopectins, right? Yes. So many sugars make up a polysaccharide. So this is also going to be a polymer. Let's see the next one. It's going to be lipids given over here. So lipids, we already know lipids are esters of fatty acids, right? Yes. They are esters of fatty acids and glycerols. So which is going to be only two compounds, which is not literally made up of large compounds, can I say? 
So we cannot choose this as a polymer. It's going to be only two molecules, right? So we cannot choose it as a polymer. So this is going to be the correct option. The next one is nucleic acids. Usually nucleic acids are nothing but the DNA and the RNA, we can say, right? You, DNA and RNA are usually made up of nitrogenous bases like adenine, guanine, cytosines, thiamines. All those things are going to be the nitrogenous bases. Along with it, there's going to be phosphate. Phosphate is going to be just a minute. Phosphate is going to be present over here. And then we can say uh, they are also having some amount of sugars present, deoxyribose sugars or ribose sugar. So this is also a polymer. This is also a polymer. This is also a polymer. But lipids are not polymers, which means we can say they are micromolecules. So they are micromolecules, whereas the rest of the things are going to be macromolecules. So the answer for this question is option C. Yes, understood all of you? Yes. Okay, next we'll move on to the next question. So in a polysaccharide, the individual monosaccharides are linked by which of these is given over here, right? We know what's a monosaccharide, yes, but they have given polysaccharide. So let's take an example and we will understand. So I'm going to talk about, uh, let's take cellulose. Yes, let's take cellulose because it's a polysaccharide. Cellulose are usually present in uh, the plant cell wall, we can say. It is also present in the uh, skeleton, the exoskeletons of arthropods, we can say, right? Yes. So cellulose are usually made up of beta D glucoses. So you already know what's a beta D glucose. Beta D glucose means the hydroxyl groups are varying in both positions, right? Yes, suppose let's draw that. So it's going to be OH and H, and this is going to be H and OH, and this is going to be OH and H, and this is going to be H and OH. So you can see the OH is actually in different, different positions. And here it's going to be CH2OH, and it's going to be H over here. And there would be many molecules which would be present over here like this. So what exactly happened here? It's going to be H, no H. So what exactly would have happened here? It would be, let me write OH over here. Yes, let me write H over here. So what exactly would have happened? There would be, form let me write H here. Let it be like this. So the rest of the things. So what would have happened? This OH and H will combine together. So you will get a bond like this. So it's going to be H and then O, and then it's going to be H, and it's going to be like this. So this bond is called as what? Glycosidic bonds. It's going to be 1 comma 4 glycosidic beta, 1 comma 4 glycosidic bonds. So what's the bond that is formed between the monosaccharides? We can say it's going to be option A. Peptide bonds you will usually see in proteins. Ester bonds you will see in all the lipids. And phosphodiester bonds you will always see in nucleic acids. So the answer for this question is going to be option A. Yes. Okay. The next question is given over here. Which of the following are correct is given. So we have to choose the correct options. Right? Yes. So solution culture or hydroponics. You already know what's hydroponics. Hydroponics is going to be uh, the plant tissue culture methods they used to use. They used to grow uh, the plants without the soil media. So usually they used to use Muraji can see medium and they used to grow the plants in that medium, which used to be like kind of uh, transparent color, we can say, and they have, and they're very, very important because they have a lot of minerals present over there. Okay, yes. So this is a correct statement. Yes, it is a correct statement. And sodium, silica, and cobalt and selenium are beneficial elements required by higher plants. So sodium is very, very important for closing and opening of stomata. It is involved in many enzymes and all these things. Even silica is also involved in preventing the drought conditions, and it is also involved, it's a component of many enzymes. Cobalt is also a component of many enzymes. Selenium also uh, helpful for the growth of many plants, and it prevents the stress conditions. So it is very important for the plant. We cannot say it's going to be an essential element, but it's a beneficial element, we can say. So this is also a correct statement. Yes, it is also correct. Zinc is the activator of nitrogenase, while molybdenum is the activator of alcohol dehydrogenase is given over here, which is just the opposite they have given. So zinc is the activator of actually, it's going to be alcohol dehydrogenase. We already know alcohol dehydrogenase is the enzyme which actually converts or oxidizes primary alcohol and a secondary alcohol into an aldehyde and then a ketone. So it's actually helpful for uh, converting them into aldehyde and ketone by undergoing oxidation. So at the time, what they will do, they will just release the NAD plus combines with H plus to form NADH. So here you will always see, this is the uh, alcohol dehydrogenase is going to be a zinc enzyme. 
it's called a zinc enzyme so the answer is this is the wrong statement which they have made it oppositely and molybdenum is the activator of nitrogenase not alcohol dehydrogenase so we know nitrogenase is involved in the nitrogen fixation without this enzyme there's not no bacteria can fix the atmospheric nitrogen in the soil so it's going to be nitrogenase so this statement is a wrong statement right yes and then zinc is needed for auxin uh, synthesis yes zinc is very very important auxins are very important for the root growth so zinc is needed for auxin synthesis yes so this is also a correct statement so what are the correct statement the statement first statement second statement and the last statements are going to be correct so we can say option 1 option 2 and then option 4 so answer is going to be option b right yes we we'll move on to the next question denitrification yes very easy question always any kind of questions used to come in this uh, nitrifications or denitrification any one question will be coming from this so we can say denitrification is carried by which of these organs first let's understand what is nitrification and then we will understand the denitrification so nitrification we can say it's the process in which the atmospheric nitrogen we can say atmospheric nitrogen is fixed in the soil because uh, plants cannot utilize the atmospheric nitrogen as such so they have to be converted into a usable form so atmospheric nitrogen is converted into nitrite and then nitrates so it's converted as nitrites and nitrates so this is usually assisted by some bacteria like nitrifying bacteria like nitrosomonas nitrobacter nitrococcus all these things are nitrifying bacteria so this are nitrifying bacteria they would not be denitrifying bacteria what's the role of the denitrifying bacteria let's see that also it's going to be denitrification yes so denitrification is just the opposite of what's going to happen the nitrates and the nitrites are getting converted with the help of pseudomonas which is a denitrifying bacteria and then there's going to be thiobacillus and these two things are going to convert them into atmospheric nitrogen and nitrous oxides so only pseudomonas and then there's another bacteria which usually comes in our examination which is going to be thiobacillus so we can take um, option b as the correct option okay so answer is going to be option b let's move on to the next question so which of the following element is very important this is a very important question which used to come many a times in question papers it's been repeated many a times so we can say which of the following element is necessary for translocation of sugars in plants given so it is always going to be boron borons are the one we know that sugars are actually in photosynthesis they are produced as glucose glucose is a very reactive uh, sugar and it's going to be um, a reducing sugar also which means because of the presence of an aldehyde group they're going to convert the cuprates into cupric acid which means they're very reactive which means whenever they go in the plant uh, translocated as such what exactly would have happened there's a chance they would react with any other molecules so that's why glucose is not transported as such in plants but it is transported as sucrose because we know that sucroses are going to be non reducing sugar which means what they will not be uh, able to convert a cuprose into cupric acid because if you talk about sucrose they are made up of two sugars which is going to be alpha d glucoses and beta d fructoses so in the fourth first position the aldehyde is lost in the second position the ketone is lost so two groups are also lost so they cannot reduce cuprose into cupric so they are always transported as sucrose which is not reactive and then which is a non reducing sugar but they will be stored as what starch they will be stored as starch in case of plants it is yes. so for this translocation of this glucose boron is very very important so answer for this question is going to be option a okay we'll move on to the next question so phosphorus is absorbed by plants in the form of what so h2po4 minus h2po4 minus or h2po4 2 minus or h2o h2po so it's going to be option 1 and 2 the answer is option 1 and 2 so option is Okay, let's move on to the next question. Okay, which of the following is a parasitic fungi? It's a very important question. You have to remember all the fungi which is given over here. So you have to remember what is Ascomycetes. You have to remember what is Basidiomycetes. You have to remember what is Phycomycetes. 
all the things in detail. So we can say albigore. Albigore is a very important one, which is mainly a parasitic fungi. And this parasitic fungi will be present in mustards. Okay, yes. And yeast, you already know, yeast is going to be, uh, uh, we can say it's a unicellular one. It's not going to be a multicellular one. And it is not going to be a parasitic forms usually. There are Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which are responsible for producing alcohols, we can say. So it is going to be not a parasitic fungi, we can say. So you can go in for rejection method. And Piscinia, Piscinia usually causes, uh, uh, they are parasitic fungi, which you can see in case of uh, wheat, maize, oats, barley. So it causes wheat trust diseases, right? Yes. Ucilago also causes, uh, it's a parasitic infection, which causes corn smut, right? Yes. So the question is given like it is in corn, it is in wheat, but the question is mustard plant. So it is going to be albigo, right? Yes. So it's a phycomyxitis, which is going to be albigo. Okay. Timo Dina discovered an infectious agent, which is given over here. And this agent was smaller than the viruses and have the following characteristics. Yes. Usually if we talk about any kind of viruses, right? Yes. So usually if you're talking about viruses, viruses usually have DNA or RNA, right? Yes, as a genetic material. DNA or RNA as a genetic material. And then we can say they also have a protein coat. And this protein coat is called as capsids. So capsids are made up of a lot of capsomeres, right? Many capsomeres. So viruses are going to be smaller, but here it is mentioned that they're smaller than the viruses. So let's see viroids. The answer for this question is viroids, which means they causes potato spindle tuber five diseases. And they also cause some infections in citruses. They cause infections in cucumbers, all the same. And they do not have proteins. They do not have any kind of protein codes called capsules. So they have free RNA and the molecular weight of RNA, the genetic material is very low when you compare it with the virus. And that's the main reason they are going to be smaller than the viruses. So it's going to be viroids. Let's see virions. Virions usually have proteins and they have RNA as the genetic material. So this is also smaller than viruses, but they have given RNA only. So we cannot choose this option. Please don't get confused with virions and viroids. Viroids has only RNA, they do not have proteins. So the answer for this question is B. Let's see option D, mycoplasma. Mycoplasma or bacteria without a cell wall. So this is also not the correct option. So the answer for this question is option B, yes. So let's move on to the next question, yes. Okay. So contagium, vivum, fluidum. Contagium is nothing but contagious. Vivum is living. Fluidum is going to be um, contagious. Fluid, we can say, it was actually proposed by which, which of the person which is given over here? It's by Bajernik. So Bajernik is the person who is the one who said the virus are going to be infectious and it's going to cause infection in many human beings, plants and animals. Who is this Ivanovsky? I was, Ivanovsky is the father of virology. He studied about the nature of viruses. He was talking about the nature of viruses. And Stanley was the one who crystallized the viruses. And Robert Cook is the one who was talking about the cells. He was absorbing the cells under the microscope, the primitive microscope, not the phase contrast microscope that we have, or we can say the electron microscope that we have. It's going to be the primitive microscope, we can say, right, yes. So the answer for this question is Bajernik. Okay, yes, very simple. Okay, next we'll move on to the next question. Which of the following components provides sticky character to the bacteria? Yes, this is very important. You already know a bacteria has a cell wall and they have a cell membrane and they have glycocalyx. So glycocalyx is also present over here. This glycocalyx is the one which is made up of this glycocalyx is usually glycoproteins. Glyco means uh, carbohydrates and they are made up of proteins. So this structure makes a sticky characteristics to the bacteria. You have studied molecular basis of inheritance in that we studied about the capsules, all those things in detail, right? Yes, so glycocalyx is the one which gives sticky. So option is, answer is going to be option C. Okay, next is going to be column of Bertini is given over here. So what's column of Bertini? You already know this is going to be the... Let me draw, this is going to be the kidney, suppose, let's draw, this is going to be the kidney, and this is going to be the pelvic region. So this is going to be pelvic region. And this area is going to be the cortex region. So the outer area is going to be, I'm not talking about the fats and all these things, I'm just talking, this is going to be the cortex, and this central portion is going to be the medulla. 
And in this medulla region, there's going to be a lot of medullary pyramids. So this is going to be the medullary pyramids. And there are calluses. I'm not going to draw all these things. It's going to be medullary pyramids. And in this area, this area, right? Yes, this is going to be the column of Bertini. So this is called as column of Bertini. Now let's see where it is extending from. You can say from the cortex, it is extending and it is going to the pelvic region. So cortex into pelvis. So we can say the answer for this question is going to be option B. Yes. So let's move on to the next question, which is given over here. So which of the following enzyme is correctly paired with its function? Okay, let's see this. So Reni, we already know what's the role of a Reni. Allosterone is given. Antidiuretic hormone is given. Angiotensin is given. Reni is the one enzyme. We might have studied DRAS, right? Yes, they mean angiotensin, allosterone, mechanisms or systems, we can say. Right? Renin is responsible for the formation of angiotensin nogens and then angiotensin 1 and then angiotensin 1. This angiotensin 2 is the one which stimulates the aldosterones that are present in the kidneys and adrenal cortex. They will stimulate the adrenal cortex to release this one. And this aldosterone is mainly responsible for sodium reabsorption. Yes, sodium reabsorption is actually carried out by aldosterones. So aldosterone regular water reabsorption is given over here, which is a wrong statement. It is going to be sodium reabsorption only. So this is a correct statement. We can say, yes, it is correct. Antidiuretic hormone is a powerful vasoconstrictor that stimulates the secretion of aldosterone is given over here. ADH main role, suppose if we have to talk about the ADH, the main role is for water reabsorption. We can otherwise call it as what? Vasopresence, also we can call it. Okay, it is not for sodium reabsorption, it is for water reabsorption. Let's see this one. Angiotensin promotes reabsorption of sodium. No, angiotensin actually to promote the aldosterones to be produced, and aldosterones are the one which are responsible for sodium reabsorption. So this is also a wrong statement, right? Yes. So we can say the correct answer for this uh, one out eight question is going to be option A. So this is a wrong statement. This is only water reabsorption, but they have given aldosterone. This is a water reabsorption is given where it is only sodium reabsorption. And this is correct. So the answer for this question is only first option is correct. So please re remember whether it's given correct options or incorrect options. A large quantity uh, of one of the following is removed from the body by lungs. Yes, lungs plays a very, very important role, you can say. It removes carbon dioxide and water. So you have to remember lungs usually have a lot of carbon dioxide and water and they are responsible for removing these things. So the answer for this question is option C. Let me see the next question. Okay, a decrease in the blood pressure uh, volume will not cause the release of which of these things. Okay, let's say the blood pressure decreases. So blood pressure decreases means which is beyond the level, beyond very less, less than the normal pressure we can say. So we have to bring that to a normal level. So that time we already know the glomerulus plays a very important role for filtering it, right? Yes. So what exactly would have happened over here is, so they will stimulate first the renin, and then angiotensin 1, and then angiotensin 2, and this angiotensin 1 and angiotensin 2 will stimulate the aldosterones. When the aldosterones are produced, the sodium reabsorption will take place, and then we can say the ADH, which is responsible for water reabsorption. So, renin is also stimulated, aldosterone is also stimulated, ADH is also stimulated. So, we can say all the organs are involved in it, like we can say, uh, liver is involved in it, we can say heart is involved in it, the kidneys are involved in it, the renal tubules are involved in it, but ANF does not involve when there is going to be a decrease in the blood pressure. All the three hormones only when will be involved. So we can say which will not cause the release of ANF. So it's going to be option A. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Synapsis, or we can say synapsis occurs between, yes, synapsis is nothing but, um, we can say the binding of two homologous chromosomes, yes, this is going to be one homologous chromosome, and it's going to be another homologous chromosome. So here, what exactly happened? They will come in contact with each other. So this is a, a sister chromatid, and this is a sister chromatid, but this one and this one are going to be non-sister chromatids. 
So we can say synapses usually occurs between two homologous chromosomes. So the answer for this question is going to be option D. Yes. It's going to be option D, right? Yes. So let's move on to the next question. The best stage to count the chromosomes during mitosis or its structure can be seen in which phase? Very easy. You will always see in metaphase. In prophase, you will not see any chromosomal structures. Of course, chromatin fibers will be changed into chromosomes, but metaphase is only you will see the chromosomes. They would be arranged in the equatorial planes. Like you will see all the chromosomes that are actually arranged in the equatorial plane like this. So only in this stage, you can see the structures or the numbers. You can count the number of chromosomes. The next is going to be enzyme recombinase is given. Recombinase enzyme is very important. Without this enzyme, two homologous chromosomes will not undergo crossing over. So we know what, what is crossing over, right? Yes, we know. Because uh, you are different from your father. You might be different from your mother. Everything happens because of the crossing over that happens between two homologous chromosomes. Right? Yes. So it's not necessary this arm only will be undergoing crossing over. Any of the arms can be undergoing crossing over. I'm just mentioning these two are going to be undergoing crossing over. So they will combine with each other. We already know about the chiasmata, which is the X shape which will be formed in this phase. So we can say this is going to be the non-sister chromatids. So crossing over takes place between non-sister chromatids. So this uh, recombinase enzyme is very important for binding two homologous chromosomes together. And this you will see in the pachytene stage. So answer for this question is option A. Yes, so we we'll move on to the next question. Yes, next is a very simple question. So during which phase of cell cycle, the amount of DNA in a cell remains at 4C level? Usually, suppose let's talk about interfaces. G1, S, and G2 phase. In G1 phase, the chromosome number, let's write the chromosome number is 2N. And the DNA content, which is called as the C value, is usually going to be 2C, which means the content of DNA. In the beginning, the cell usually has um, less number of DNA, but when it undergoes S phase, because we know S phase is responsible for DNA replication. During this phase, the DNA would be duplicated. The number of DNA increases. The original copy will also be there and the new copy will also be there. So during S phase, what would have happened? The chromosome number is going to remain the same, but the C value is going to be doubled because the DNA is duplicated. So it's going to be doubled. And in G2 phase, the chromosome number still remains the same. And the C value remains forced. So that's the question given here. Please don't get confused. Only in the S phase, it's going to be 4C. But the question given over here is it remains at 4C. It still remains at 4C in the G2 phase. So it's going to be option C, only G2. So the answer is going to be option C. Okay, we'll see the next question. So which of the following hormones act upon the renal tubules and blood capillaries also is given over here. We already know what's the role of glucagon. Glucagon is going to do an opposite action, right? Yes. So it's mainly responsible for water reabsorption. If glucagon is not going to be present, the water reabsorption. That's why people who have this uh, problem, diabetes, insipidus, used to urinate a lot. Right? Yes. And aldosterone, if you know, we just now we studied, it's going to be uh, so sodium reabsorption. And vasopressin is ADH. So ADH has a greater role in absorbing water, whether it is in the renal tubules or it is in the blood capillary. So the answer for this question is option C. Yes, yes. So the answer is option C. Let's move on to the next question. Choose the following uh, correct statement about neurohypophysis. It's going to be the uh, posterior part of the pituitary. Hypophysis is subpituitary. So neurohypophysis is posterior part of the pituitary. Usually, if the pituitary has to be activated, the master gland, which is going to be the hypothalamus, right? Hypothalamus used, usually sends um, simulating hormones, not the hormones which ultimately produce. It's going to be simulating. So they will simulate the pituitary gland to simulate the hormones or to produce the hormones. So what exactly happens? It stores and releases hormones secreted by the hypothalamus. So whatever the hypothalamus stimulating hormones are produced, that will uh, stimulate the neurohypophysis to produce the respective organs. We can say like oxytoxins, or we can say ADH. So oxytoxin is responsible for the contraction of the uterus during pregnancy or during the parturitions, we can say, right? Yes. So the answer for this question is option A. 
The next is going to be sleep wake cycle. Yes, we sleep, we wake up. So everything is very important. Which hormone is going to control the sleep wake cycle? We can say it's going to be menstrual cycle as well as the sleep wake cycle is given. It's always going to be melatonin. Melatonin is a hormone which is mainly responsible for controlling our sleep. So sleep wake cycle is mainly by them. Another important thing is progesterone. So progesterone usually makes the uterine walls very, very thick we can say. And then oxytoxins, we already know oxytoxins are very important for contracting the uterus during parturition times. Okay. Yes. So that is also not the correct answer, as you can say. MSH is going to be the melatonin stimulating hormones. You can see melatonins are going to be the one which actually gives uh, pigments to the colors, right? Melatonin pigments are actually released by them. So this is also going to be a wrong statement. So we can say option B is a correct answer. Yes. Okay. Let's move on to the next question. Yes. Which of the following is correct for thyrocalcitonin? Yes. So usually the calcium should not be very much higher also. The calcium should not be very much lower also. So if the calcium is going to be very high, it has to be brought down to a normal level. So especially in the blood plasma, we can say, right? Yes. So we can say the answer for this question is this thyrocalcitonin is produced by thyroids. Please don't get confused with parathyroids. It is also produced by the thyroid gland, which is the butterfly gland, right? Yes. And decreases calcium in ECF, extracellular fluids, or we can say uh, blood plasma, right? Yes. So the answer for this question is option B. Yes. So we move on to the next question. Yes. Which of the following is going to be the correct statement, which examples are given over here? Which of the following pairs of hormones are example that can easily pass through the cell membrane is given? Yes, first thing you have to remember is cell membrane. Suppose if I'm going to talk about a cell membrane, a cell membrane is made up of phospholipids. Yes, phosphate and lipids. So usually the polar molecules or water-loving molecules cannot pass through lipids because they cannot pass because we know that if you mix the water in a oil, ultimately it's not going to mix together properly, right? Yes. So we cannot say all polar molecules can go inside. Suppose if you're talking about insulin, insulin receptor will be present on the outer surfaces because insulin cannot go inside. So insulin used to come over here. Glucagon also used to come over here. Thyroxin also will be come over here because thyroxin receptor is present here on the cell membrane. Insulin also receptor is present on the cell membrane. Glucagon, somatostatin, oxytocins, everything receptors is present on the cell membrane. But cortical and testosterone are steroids. So they are steroid. What does it mean? They are lipids. So if they are lipid, can they cross through the cell membrane? Yes, they can. So that can easily pass through the cell membrane is going to be steroid hormones. So the steroid hormones given over here is option B. So answer for this question is option B. Yes. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Pyrenoids. Yes. Pyrenoids in a uh, green algal cells are related to which of these functions? So one is going to be starch formation, protein storage, general metabolism, enzyme secretion. You will always see pyrenoids. Pyrenoids are usually one core proteins along with the starch granules. You can say it used to be present in the chloroplast. Suppose if you're talking about the spirogyra, spirogyra used to have a spiral chloroplast. And inside the spiral chloroplast, you might be having like uh, three to uh, four um, amount of pyrenoids, we can say. That is mainly for the starch formation. So answer for this question is going to be option A. Yes, so this is the answer to this question. Okay, let's see the next question, which is going to be protonema. Uh, and leafy stage is given over here. It's found in which of these? Very important, you have to remember mosses. So one example I'm taking is going to be funaria. In funaria, we know this the dominant phase is going to be gametophytic phase, which we can say gametophytic phase has two things, which is going to be a juvenile phase. And the next one is going to be uh, the leafy phase. So suppose juvenile phase, it used to be like this. It used to be like, it just starts sprouting off. And in the leafy stage, you can see the entire plant grows like this, right? Yes, they have root-like appearances, leaf-like appearances, stem-like appearances, but they are not real roots, right? Yes, this is going to be the gametophytic stage, which is the haploidic stage. So this you will see predominant stage in which of the life cycle, only in the mosses. In dicots, it's going to be angiosperms, which you will see only sporophytes are dominant. Liverworts also you cannot see it. Gymnosperms is also sporophytic stage. So answer for this question is option A. Okay, let's see the next question. 
match column one with column two and choose the correct option. Yes, let's see. Theo phi C A, rhodo phi C A. So rhodo, for those who forget things, please remember R. So red algae. So red algae, you have to remember gelidium, gracilaria, polyzophonia, porphyra, all these things are going to be red algae. So B is going to be option four. So only thing you can see over here is option A. Yes. So let's see the rest of the things. Pteridophytes, it is the first terrestrial plant with vascular tissue, phloem, and xylem. So it's going to be option two, right? Yes. So D is going to be option two. Yes, it is first option only. Let's anyway confirm it. See, mosses usually have a spore dispersal. In case of Pinaria, if you see, they have a sporophytic stage. In sporophytic stage, usually arises from gametophytic stage. Usually, the sporophytic stage are actually dependent on the gametophytic stage, right? Yes. So they have an elaborate mechanism of the spore dispersal. And the first one is going to be the asexual reproduction by the formation of zoo spores. So the answer for this question is option A. It's going to be very simple, right? Yes. Okay. Which one of the following mass with their definition in pinuses? Usually pinuses are going to be having the male reproductive part and the female reproductive part are going to be present in the same plant. It's present in the same plant. But you should not get confused with cycles. Cycles are going to be dioecious. Male cycles is going to be different. Female plant is going to be different. But in pinus, it is going to be monoecious. They have both the male and the female reproductive cones, or we can say the uh, sporophylls, which are combined together as uh, cones, are going to be produced on the same plant. So answer to this question is option A. Yes, let's move on to the next question. Yes, after karyogamy followed by uh, meiosis, Spores are produced exogenously in which of the following is given over here, right? Yes, so we'll see. So, Neurospora, Alternaria, Saccharomyces, and then Agaricus. So, Agaricus usually belongs to, uh, you can see it's a mushroom, right? We already know it's going to be mushrooms, Agaricus. So, which comes under Basidiomycetes, which is like a, a ball-shaped fungi, you can say, right? Saccharomyces is the yeast, we can say. They used to produce uh, endogeneously, we can say, yes. Alternaria, Alternaria is going to be the deuteromyces cases, right? Which are imperfect fungi. And Neurospora is going to be ascomycetes. So, the answer for this question is option D, yes. The next question, head zone. Yes, let's see this head zone is given over here. So ultimately, one question you can expect from this skeletal ones. So let me draw, this is going to be the actins. So which are mainly responsible for the contractions. And this is going to be the meiosis. So let's consider this is going to be the meiosis. So this is the meiosis. I'm going to draw only edge band, okay? Yes. So this area is going to be the edge band. Yes. And this myosin band is going to be the A band. Right? Yes, okay, listen. So H band in the skeletal muscle is due to, what is it? Extension of myosin filament in the central portion of the A band or the absence of myofibril. No, it's not, it's again a wrong statement because absence of myofibril is given over here. It's not absence, it's actually present over there. So central gap between myosin filaments in the A band is given. Yes, this is the central gap between the myosin filament in the A band. Yes, this is the A band. So answer for 125 question is going to be option yes. Option yes, 125 is going to be option. Yeah, no, no, no. The answer for this question is option D. Yes, answer for this question is option D. So the central gap between the actin filaments, yes going to be option D only. It's actins and this is going to be myosins, right? Yes. So the central gap between the actin filaments extending through the myosin filament in the A band. Yes. So this is edge band. So they are present between the actin filaments and they're extending through the myosin filaments in the A band. So answer for this question is option D only. Okay. Yes. Yes. The answer is option D only. Let's move on. The calcium is important. Yes, calcium is really important in black clottings also, right? Yes. So it's important skeletal muscle. Yes, usually uh, the calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, right? Yes, it is actually released from uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum. So what's the role of this one? They are the one which goes and binds to the trophonins. Yes. So they will remove the mask or we can say they 
they remove the mask of the active side of the actin so that actin and myosin will bind with each other like this so they will bind with each other and each will be going for the sliding filament theory we might have studied right they will pull each other so that the length of the sarcomeres get reduced so answer for this question is option d okay let's move on to the next question okay which of the following is not the feature of red muscle fibers yes red muscle fibers usually red muscle fibers has a lot of atps so they have ultimately they are going to have mitochondria a lot of mitochondria they have myoglobins yes they red muscle fibers when you compare it with the uh, white muscle fibers they are going to have high content of myo myoglobins we can say and they have high amount of sarcoplasm yes they also undergo contraction but they do not have high amount of sarcoplasm reticulum we can say because a sarcoplasm reticulum are the one which releases calcium but here they do not have that much amount but they do have sarcoplasm reticulum so we cannot say it's high amount right yes so this is going to be not the feature is given so this is the answer for this question okay yes they are called aerobic muscles yes they are aerobic which utilizes oxygen and they are responsible uh, by producing many kind of atps and all this thing right yes the next is going to be glenoid cavity yes glenoid cavity suppose if you are talking about the scapular regions this regions right it's usually this regions and then this region is going to be the glenoid cavity where it will be present suppose this is going to be the scapular regions and this is the humerus and this area is going to be the glenoid cavity so the glenoid cavity is actually between the humerus with the scapula so answer for this question is option c okay next question is experimental material are uh, used by van neel to prove that oxygen comes from water not from the carbon dioxide it was actually done with two things like we can say it was done with purple green bacteria and green sulfur bacteria this is the first thing that you will be studying in your uh, photosynthesis chapter about the history and all the things like right? yes. this so here what exactly happens let me write it over here so carbon dioxide let me write a simple uh, photosynthetic um, photosynthesis formula we can say chlorophyll and then of course light is going to be present over here and it's going to be c6 h12 and o6 plus oxygen is liberated along with atp molecules are going to be produced and then but in blue and green sulfur uh, purple sulfur bacteria we can say the um, hydrogen donor is going to be hydrogen sulfur sulfate okay this is the hydrogen donor so carbon dioxide is reduced as glucose whereas the oxygen comes from water or hydrogen sulfate we can say so we can say oxygen actually comes from water or the hydrogen donors and not from the carbon dioxide was said by van neel so the answer for this question is option c yes okay let's go to the next question okay yes so which of the following is incorrect activities associated with ps1 and ps2 of the non cyclic photophosphorylation is given over here right yes so the answer is going to be option b let me explain you so listen ps1 is going to be 700 nanometer and ps2 is going to be 680 nanometer right yes so water is oxidized in ps2 is given over here but not in ps1 is given over here water is actually oxidized where it is oxidized the splitting of water usually takes place in ps2 and it's not given in ps1 is given no it's a wrong statement right it's a right statement yes so the question is which one of the following is an incorrect statement it is a right statement only in the ps2 we can say there's going to be photolysis of water in the um, uh, cell membrane or we can say the thylakoid membrane and which are responsible for producing 2h plus plus 2 electrons plus nascent oxygen so this is the correct statement let's see the rest of the thing lights are needed to activate both ps1 and ps2 yes if a light falls onto a leaf and then it falls onto the entire epidermal layers and then it reaches the mesophyll cells and then it reaches the chloroplast and then it reaches the thylakoids in the thylakoids it's going to be ps2 and ps1 and then photons are very important for photosynthesis yes so this is also a correct statement but we have to find out which is the wrong statement so photolysis of water helps in the formation of atp and nadph yes photolysis of water complex is usually present in the inner membranes of the thylakoids so what exactly happens they produce 2h plus plus 2 electrons plus nascent oxygen and ultimately in the oxidose pathway there's going to be atp produced nadph produced and h plus also produced right yes 
Okay, let's see the last one. Production of NADPH is associated with PS2 is given. No, only in the PS1 because in PS2, there would not be any NADPH produced. In PS1 only, the NADPH will be produced. So this is going to be the wrong statement. So we can choose this option because the question is incorrect. The question they have asked is like incorrect option we have to choose. So this is going to be the incorrect option. So it's option D. Which of the following statement is incorrect regarding pigments? So pigments are substances that has the capacity to absorb light. Yes, it is. So we can choose this is the correct statement. We have to find out incorrect statement, right? Yes. So chlorophyll B is the chief pigment is given over here. No, chlorophyll A is going to be the chief pigment. So this is going to be a wrong statement. Yes. So we can choose this option. Yes, because incorrect is asked. Leaf pigments can be separated by chromatography. Yes, you can separate any kind of leaf pigments like chlorophyll A or chlorophyll B or xanthophylls or carotenoids, whatever it is. You can actually separate it by any kind of chromatography, paper chromatography or any kind of chromatography, you can separate it. Okay, yes. Okay, next question. Accessory pigments protect chlorophyll from photo oxidation. Yes, accessory pigments. There are many, many, many accessory pigments which are actually present over here. And they are responsible for preventing from the photo oxidation. Yes. So this is the correct statement. But the question is, we have to select the incorrect statement, which is going to be option B. Okay, let's move on to the next question. In C4, uh, we can say plant one 14 carbon dioxide is fixed in malic acid. Which of the following enzyme is used to fix carbon dioxide? Yes, which is going to be PEP cases or PEPCO, whatever it is. So PEP cases usually combines and they are the one which actually fixes the carbon dioxide, which combines with, um, we can say there would be formation of what oxaloacetic acids, we can say, right? Yes. So we can, um, it's helpful in the fixation of malic acids. It will usually, if you see this entire C4 pathway, you can also see there's going to be malic acid, which will be formed. So it's going to be option C, phosphoene or PEP. Usually it's going to be like PEP cases combines with PEP, right? And ultimately leads to the formation of oxaloacetic acids. So it's going to be option C, okay? It's going to be option C, this one. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Okay, consider the following statements regarding the root system of angiosperms and we have to find out the correct options. Yes, so in monocots, the fibrous roots arises from the base of the stem, let's leave as it is. Okay, we have to find out the non, uh, which is going to be the incorrect statement, right? Yes, so let's see this question just a minute. Let's see this question, yes. So in monocots, the fibrous root system arises from the base of the stem. Yes. So is it a correct statement? Yes, it is correct. Okay. The region of elongation is called as the root hair regions. No. The region of elongations do not have root hair regions. The region of maturation has the root hair region. So this is going to be a wrong statement. Yes, it is going to be a wrong statement. In sweet potatoes, the adventitious roots get swollen and store food. Yes, it is correct. Okay, let's see this one. The stem of maize and sugar cans have supporting roots called stilt roots. It's not prop roots, right? It's going to be stilt roots because prop roots you will see in banyan trees only, which used to fall from the branches and it used to proceed on to the ground and it used to support the anchorages, mainly for anchorages, we can say. So option one and three are correct, but option two and four are going to be wrong. Yes, so answer is going to be option D. Okay. Let's see the next question. Which of the following statements are correct um, about the leaf is given over here, right? Yes, so we will see this one. Okay, leaf is lateral and generally flattened structure worn on the stem is given. Yes, usually you can see the leaf is the one uh, which is actually coming out from the pedicels and they have uh, generally a flat structure worn on the stem. Yes, it is correct. Yes, you can say it develops at the nodes and bears the body. Yes, it actually develops from, suppose this is the stem, they used to arise from every node. They used to arise from every node, right? And they have a buds, which is called as axillary buds. Yes, so this is also correct, yes. Leaves originate from the root apical medicine is given over here. No, leaves usually arises from the shoot. So they would not arise from the root, they would be arising from the shoot only. So it's going to be shoot, but they have given root. So this is a wrong statement. But the question given over here is you have to select the correct statement. So you cannot choose this. So they are the most important 
vegetative organ for reproduction yes they are vegetative organs not the flowering organs you can say it's going to be the vegetative organ so we can say option one two and four are going to be the correct option right yes so we can choose the option as this one two yes you can choose the option one and two yes this one only because vegetative is given over here which we cannot choose it is usually going to be reproduction means involved only flowers leaves are actually not involved so we can choose the option only a okay yes okay in x the high gynecium occupies the highest position suppose let's talk about this they have asked gynecium occupies the highest position so let's see hypogynous flowers so if we have to talk about hypogynous flowers usually the this is going to be the ovary and from the ovary there would be like um, we can say this is the sepals and there's going to be petals there would be petals and then there's going to be androsiums male reproductive organ and then there's going to be gynation so this is going to be the uh, style and then there's going to be stigma right yes so we can say superior ovary the ovary is present above so gynation occupies the highest position yeah this is the female reproductive part girl you just remember like that so it's going to be female gynations so it is the highest position all other parts are situated below yes the ovary is superior yes so the answer is going to be hypogynous so x is going to be hypogynous y is superior but you uh, in case of perigynous it is half inferior it will be present at the rim of the thalamus all the other leaves will be arising in case of epigynous we will say it's going to be completely inferior but they have asked uh, this question so answer is option c how many plants in the list given below have marginal placentation usually marginal placentation means they used to have um, the entire placenta used to present in the ovules onto the peripheral regions right yes so we can say all the examples like gram one and then sun hemp and then arhar and then moon and then we can say pea plant one two three four five and then lupins so six plants are going to have this marginal one so we can choose the option as option See. Okay, let's proceed on with the next question. Few nidarians like corals have a skeleton composed of calcium carbonates. Nidarians are the one which has nidoblasts, which is the stinging cells, and they also called as seal and trays mainly because of um, gastrovascular cavity. We can say right, yes, and they are they have pores which are mainly made up of calcium carbonates, which is a simple question. A student was given a specimen to identify the characteristics of the specimen that was given to him, and he has to find out what is it going to be. Segmented ones you will see in analogs. Yes, metamerically and metamerism is segmentation usually. And closed circulatory system you will see in analogs only. And in earthworms, if you see, they have a muscular and a longitudinal muscles for its locomotion. So ferritima is going to be the earthworm, which is going to be an analog. So answer for this question is option B. Okay, let's move on to the next question. So which of the following sets of animals shares four chambered heart? Yes. So let's see. Mammals, we human beings have four chambered hearts, two auricles and two ventricles. Yes. So only uh, two options are given over here. Let's check B and D. Okay. And birds. Birds has four chambered hearts. Yes. Crocodiles. Crocodiles has four chambered hearts. Even though they are reptiles. Let's say amphibians. Amphibians usually have three chambered hearts. And reptiles has three chambered heart except except crocodiles. So crocodiles have. Four chambered hearts. Birds and mammals has four chambered heart. So answer for this question is option B. Okay, let's go on to the next question. So in which of the following the genus name? Its two characters and phylums are not matched. Is it not matched? Okay. Yes. So let's check. Periplanata is going to be uh, the Americana periplanata, which is going to be the cockroaches, right? Yes. So they have a jointed appendages. Yes, they have a jointed appendages, and they have a chitinous exoskeleton is given over. Yes. So it is correct. Arthropod is also given. So this is correct. Cycan is a pore bearing ones. Yes, they have a water canal system. Water canal system is not responsible for locomotion, but it's responsible for reproduction. Please don't get confused. And porifera, this is also correct. Asterisk is nothing but the starfishes, and they have spiny skin. Echinodermata means spiny skin bodies. So, water vascular system is present. Yes, it is correct. 
Phyla is going to be snails. Apple snails, we can say they are soft body one. They do not have segment, but they have given segmented. So this is going to be the wrong one. They have radula, like a rasping organs. They have muscular uh, food. They have a muscular hump. They have visceral humps, we can say. And they have a head, everything present. But this is a wrong statement. So we have to choose option A is the wrong ones. They ask you to select the wrong one. So it's option A. Which one of the following gibberlin is to be discovered? And it is the first discovered ones. So it is always gibberlin acid 3. GA3 is the first discovered one. So answer is option C. Okay, cytokinin is given over here. Cytokinin's main role is to inhibit apical dominance. They would not let the plant to grow taller. They would let the plant to grow uh, very wider, we can say, right? Yes. Suppose if you're taking... Um, like grasses. Grasses used to grow wider. When you go to a garden, they used to cut the tip of the uh, grasses because they don't want the uh, grasses to grow taller, but they want them to grow in a long like fashion, like a, in a wider fashion, right? Yes. So that time, apical dominance, until and unless the apical, apex region is present, they would not let the lateral branches to grow. So cytokinin inhibits the apical dominance. They would not promote the apical dominance. The first option itself tells you it's a wrong statement. It's not the function of a cytokinin. So answer is going to be option A. Okay, let's see the next one. Nowadays, ethylene is not used for ripening. They use something else apart from it because ethylenes, when you use, they have a high diffusion rates. So then now they are using epiphones, which is the modified version. That's it. Simple. So answer is going to be option A. Membrane is extension in blue-green algae, we can say, are known as chromatophores. Yes. So we can say usually if you see blue-green algae are going to be cyanobacteria which, which have pigments in it, which gives color. So that is because of chromatophores. So it's a very simple question, which is option A. The next question is going to be polysomes is given over here. Uh, poly means many, somes means ribosomes. Is a chain. Suppose we know in protein synthesis we have studied there's going to be mRNA and ribosomes are present over here. So this is going to be mRNA and this is going to be ribosomes. Right, yes, ribosomes are large subunit and small subunit. So if there are going to be many ribosomes bound to one mRNA, then we call it this ribosomes as polysomes. So it is related to ribosomes. It is option B. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Uh, the membrane of erythrocyte, it's a biomolecular question. How much is the percentage of protein and lipids? 52% proteins and it's going to be 40% lipids. It's a direct question from your NCRT book. Right, yes. Okay, let's move on to the next question. In which of the following, um, the cells are held together by calcium pectate. Please don't forget it. Usually you have to remember it. The calcium pectate, we can say it's usually going to be present in the middle lamella. Yes, middle lamella. Only this one is going to be present over there. So it's going to be option C. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Okay, which of the following statement is correct regarding vacuoles is given over here. Vacuoles are membrane bound, but what is the vacuoles? Usually vacuoles are present in animals also, plants also, but plants, vacuoles are kind of larger and they have, they have water, uh, they have proteins, uh, they have mainly excretory products and they are the storage forms. They will store food also, we can say. So we can say it's a membrane bound, it contains water and excretory substances. So this is the appropriate answer. So we have to choose the answer as B. Which meristem help in increasing the curve, the sideways, the, we can say uh, the width, can I say? Yes, so it's hel helpful for increasing the girth, so it's going to be its lateral meristem, right? Yes, it's option A. The next question, uh, the vascular bundle in which uh, the protoxylum is pointing out the periphery. Protoxylum, protoxylum are usually going to be smaller like this, whereas the metaxylum are kind of larger. Suppose this is the peripheral region. So protoxylum, if it is present in the peripheral region, then this kind of arrangement is used to vascular bundle arrangement is called as exarch. Suppose if it's like ulta, if, if the uh, protoxylum is present inside and metaxylum is onto the outside, then it's going to be endarch condition. It's always related to the protoxylum. If protoxylum outside, it is exarch. If protoxylum inside, it is endarch. So answer for this question is option B. Okay, let's see the next question. Which of the following statement is incorrect is given over? Epidermal cell has small amount of cytoplasm and large virtues. Is it correct? Yes, let's see. It's correct. Uh, they have asked the incorrect ones. Okay, let's see. Waxy cuticle is absent in roots. Let's see. God's, yes, it is correct. 
root has a unicellular yes usually root has a unicellular but stem has or trichomes which help trichomes are the one which prevents transpiration so they are multicellular yes this is also correct statement trichomes may be branched usually if it's epidermal this trichomes used to arise like this they are preventing transpiration yes it is correct god sells a dumbbell in dicots given in dicots god sells are usually bean shaped they are usually like this they are not going to be like this so only in the molar cots we can say they are going to be dumbbell shape so they have just made it crosswise so it is going to be the wrong statement so we can say only uh, fourth step fifth statement right yes so we can say d is going to be the correct answer okay let's see the next question some vascular systems are described as um, open so open vascular systems are the one which is responsible for secondary growth which means they have what can cambiums cambiums are the one which is responsible for the formation of secondary xylem and secondary phloem so we can say they are capable of producing secondary xylem and phloem suppose if you are talking about it so this is going to be the cambium and this cambium is responsible for the formation of secondary xylem and secondary phloem or we can say secondary root so answer for this question is option b answer for this one okay peri cycle of root produces what mechanical support usually lateral root peri cycle we already know is the one which produces the lateral root so answer for this question is option b okay let's see the next question cell a and cell b are adjacent plant cells so they have given so we are going to find out Uh, the water potential for it, and we are going to find out. So, water potential is being equal to osmotic potential plus pressure potential. So, I am writing osmotic potential as OP and pressure potential as PP, and this is going to be water potential. So, let's calculate for cell A. Okay. So, for cell A, the uh, the osmotic potential is given as minus two, and the pressure potential is A, which is going to be minus twelve. Okay. Let's keep it as it is, and let's see for cell B. So for cell B, they have given minus twelve and two, so it's going to be minus ten. So ten is large, as we know that water potential. So water potential is the movement of water from the region of high concentration to region of low concentration. So minus ten is larger actually. So usually if there is no minus, we can say a twelve is larger. But here there is minus, so ten is larger. So they move from cell B to cell A. So water moves from cell B to cell A. So answer is going to be option C. Let's see the next question. Bulk flow of substances for over a long period of time to vascular tissues is called as what? It's translocation. Yes, because a large amount of um, substances or food has to go to a larger distance. It's mainly because of what? It's mainly because of the root pressure, or because we can say through xylem and phloem conduction. So answer is going to be option D. Casparian step is made up of superiors. Very simple question. It's option C. Teeth of adult man not present in milk dentitions or what? So usually, if you want to talk about milk teeth, if you are young, you won't be having premolars. So what is uh, in case of uh, young ages? So we we used to have two one zero two, and in case of adult, or we can say it is in the permanent teeth or adult teeth, we will have two one two three arrangement. So this is incisors. This is canines and premolars, and then there's going to be molars. So we have thirty-two adult permanent teeth. Yes, here in milk teeth we have twenty only. So premolars are actually absent in 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 case of milk dentition. It's not present in milk dentition is premolar. So answer is option B. Okay, let's see the next question. Which digestive system organs mechanically and chemically transform food bolus into tongues? Always stomach. Because bolus is uh, coming, and the stomach usually uh, uses some kind of intestinal juices and uh, stomach juices and all the things, and they will digest the food, and it's going to be called as chyme, which is partially going to be digested. So it's going to be option B. The disaccharides are secreted with usually disaccharides will be in, uh, secreted with the intestinal juices. So intestines usually secrete all the things, and then the disaccharides break down all the disaccharides into monosaccharides. So answer is going to be option C. What will happen if a secretion of parietal cells? Is parietal cells are otherwise called as auxinthic cells, right? Yes, it's called as auxinthic cell. It usually secretes HCl, and uh, it also secretes acetylcholine, which is an intrinsic factor, acetylcholine, and gastrins. 
So without a gastrin, suppose if you're talking about gastrins, if there's no gastrins, okay, they would not stimulate the oxynthic cells to produce hexyl. Suppose the question is, what happens if the parietal cells are like locked with any kind of inhibitor? So what would happen? HCL will not be produced. If HCL is not produced or in the absence of HCL, we know pepsinogens, pepsinogens are responsible for digesting proteins. So usually pepsinogens will be inactivated. If a pepsinogen is inactivated, will they be able to convert a protein? No, it's not possible, right? Yes. So inactivated pepsin cannot be converted into active pepsin to break the protein. So answer for this question is option D. Let's see the next one. So, which of the following statement is incorrect regarding cuboidal cells? Of course, it is given epithelium. So, you can choose this is a correct statement. The next is going to be cube like cells. Yes, it's the cube like cells. Yes, they are cuboidal. So, they are going to be cube like cells. They are found in the walls of blood vessels and air sacs of the lungs. It's given over here, which is actually wrong. They are actually present in the, they are mainly present in PCT. Yes, for reabsorption. And they're present in intestines or stomach everywhere, mainly for secretions and also for the reabsorption. So the wrong option is going to be option C. So you have to, they have asked incorrect, so you have to choose option C. Neuroglia cells. Usually people used to get cancers, mainly because not because of neurons, but because of glia cells, which are blue cells, right? Yes, we can say they are going to be blue cells. So we can say neuroglia cells are like the supporting and not excitable cells. Neurons are excitable cells. That's what we will see what happened, how a nerve conduction usually takes place or the nerve impulses usually takes place. It's going to be option B. Yes, let's see the next one. So choose the correct sequence which is given over in the elementary canal of cockroaches. So it's going to be crop, which is mainly for storage. Gizzard is for biting. Hepatic CK is usually six to eight. It will be present between the foreguard and the midguard. Malpigeon tubule will be present in the midguard and the hindguard, very specifically in the hindguard. And there's going to be rectum. So it's going to be option C. The next is going to be the total volume of air. Can a person can expire after inspiring, normal inspiration. If you're taking air, then you can expire a little bit. That's called expiratory capacity, EC. Yes, it's going to be the total volume. We can say uh, plus the expiratory reserve volumes, or we can say expiratory capacity. That's going to be the expiratory capacity. Which of the following are stages of respiration? Usually, respiration, we are first going to breathe. So, first you have to breathe. So, it's four. So, only three options are given. Let's see. After breathing, there has to be carbon dioxide has to go out and oxygen has to come in. So, it's going to be gaseous transport. So, four and then one. So, what are the options? Only two is given over here. And the third, it has to reach the tissue. And then it has to reach the cells because tissues, or we can say, the cells are, cells makes the tissues. So it's four, one, three, and four. Answer is option B. Incidence of emphysema or respiratory disorder is high in cigarette smokers. Why this happens? Because um, their alveolar regions, right, they get blocked. If the alveolar regions are getting blocked, what exactly would have happened is, um, since the alveolar regions are blocked, they, they would not be able to exchange the genetic material. So if they are not able to exchange the genetic mater materials, or we can say not the genetic material, we can say the carbon dioxide or oxygen. So ultimately, the person would not be able to inspire or expire, right? Yes. So incidence of epicema, we can say the alveolar walls are mainly damaged because of the toxins that is coming from the smoke. Okay, so answer is option B. What will be the PO and CO? Partial pressure. Partial pressure is nothing but uh, the pressure exerted by a single gas or millions of gases or mixture of gases. So let's see uh, partial pressure of oxygen in atmospheric air and the partial pressure in case of alveolar region. It is going to be 152 here and 140 here. And the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in atmospheric is going to be 0 0.3 and it's going to be 40. So we can say partial pressure in atmospheric air is more. So PO2 is more here. And PCO2 or partial pressure of carbon dioxide is less here. So answer is going to be option B. Okay, let's see the next question. So which of the following statement is correct or correct uh, in aerobic respiration? Yes. So oxidation of pyruvic acid by stepwise stimulation of hydrogen leading to three molecules of oxygen. No, three molecules of oxygen will not be produced. Three molecules of carbon dioxide only will be produced. You can see all the hydrogen atom leaving three carbon. Where is this three carbon dioxide that are actually produced? One carbon dioxide is actually produced in the oxidative decarboxylation when pyruvic acid is getting converted into acetyl-CoA. 
it's going to be oxidative decarboxylation. And two carbon dioxides are actually produced because acetyl CoA is going to be two carbon. If acetyl CoA is broken down, then the two carbons will be released out as carbon dioxide. So three carbon dioxide. So this is correct statement. Yes, it is correct. The passing of the electrons removed as part of the hydrogen to molecular oxygen with synthesis of ATP. Yes, oxygen is a final electron acceptor. So all the electrons are given to the molecular oxygen and ultimately in oxygen's pathway, ATP is produced. So this is also correct. ADP is not produced, so this is wrong. So second and the third options are correct. So let's see which is going to be the option. Second and third. So it's option C. Option C is the correct answer. Okay. So let's see the next one. Which one of the following reaction is an example of oxidative decarboxylation? Yes, the example of oxidative decarboxylation is pyruvic acid, which is a three carbon compound getting converted into acetyl CoA, which is going to be a two carbon compound. So, answer is going to be option C, where there is a release of carbon dioxide. Because if three carbon dioxide, uh, three molecules of carbon dioxide, the carbon is present over here, this is a two carbon compound. So, one carbon will be going out as carbon dioxide. So, since it is oxidation, so we can say oxidative decarboxylation. So answer is option C. Acceptor of acetyl CoA in Krebs cycle, of course, it's going to be oxaloacetic acid. Oxaloacetic acids are the one which accepts. This is a four carbon compound. So it accepts acetyl CoA, which is going to be two carbon compound. They form citric acid, which is going to be six carbon compound. Right? Yes. So answer is option D. In which of the following is amphibolic pathway? Very simple. Catabolism and anabolism takes place in Krebs cycle. So it's going to be TCA. So answer is option C. Pulmonary veins carrying oxygenated blood opens. Usually there's a difference. Usually we know that arteries are the one which carries oxygenated blood. But in case of pulmonary veins or pulmonary arteries, we can say pulmonary veins are the one which carries oxygenated blood, opens into left auricle is given over here. Right auricle is given over here, left ventricle is given over here, and right ventricle is given over here. So the answer for this question is always going to be left auricle. So this is going to be the right auricle, and uh, right auricle, and this is going to be the left auricle. So we choose to come over to this area. So answer is option A. Okay. Yes. One seventy three given below a four statement about the human uh, circulatory system. Arteries are thick walls. Yes, arteries are very thick walls. And they have a very narrow lumen. If they are very thick, they used to have narrow lumens, right? Compared to veins. Yes, it is a correct statement. Angina is acute chest pain. Yes, angina is acute chest pain. But it is not because the blood is not going to the brain. That's not the case. Oxygen is not present. So it's a wrong statement. Yes. So we have to find out uh, which of the statements are correct. Two of the statements are correct. Person with the blood group A can donate blood is given. No, usually a person with AB group can accept blood. So this is going to be a wrong statement. And calcium plays a very important role in blood. Yes, it's a very important thing. Yes, it's important. So we can say option one and option four are correct. So our answer is going to be option A is the correct answer. Now let's move on to the next question. Okay, the given figure is given. So we have to find out the pathway of blood. Let's see. This is going to be, this is the first one, third, fourth, and this is going to be the second one. Okay, let's see. So the answer is going to be option C. Okay, so third is going to be pulmonary arteries. Okay, let's see. So from the body uh, tissues, usually veins used to carry the deoxygenated blood. After carrying the deoxygenated blood, the pulmonary arteries carries the deoxygenated blood to the lungs. And lungs purifies all the blood and carries the oxygenated blood through pulmonary veins. And pulmonary veins brings it to the arteries. So which option is correct? One is given veins, but it's artery given wrong. And then third one is going to be pulmonary artery, correct? Pulmonary veins, fourth is given. So they have given only veins. This is wrong. So second one is going to be artery. They have given pulmonary. So this is wrong. The answer is going to be option C. So the next question, neural signal through autonomous nervous system. Usually, they help in increasing the heartbeat or decreasing the heartbeat and then increases the strength of the ventriculars and then decreases. Usually, they increase the strength of the ventricles. So we can say it's option C is going to be correct. C is correct. And they decrease the speed of conduction of action potential. Usually, they increase this, right? So we can say option A is correct. Just a minute. Option A is correct. Option C is also going to be correct. So the answer for this question is going to be A. And we can say C. And then we can say D. This is C. Let me write it A. This is B, C, D. 
E and then F. So this statement is correct. Yes, and this statement is correct. And this statement is correct, increases. So answer for this is question is D. Okay, let's see the next question. During the sodium pump of a nerve results in what? So suppose this is the axoplasm. Usually the sodium is going to be more out. Sodium will be present more out. Potassium will be present more in when they are rest. So sodium is more out and then the potassium is So answer is option A. Yes. The next is going to be corpus callosum. Corpus callosum is going to be the area where you can see in the cerebral region. Suppose you're talking this is the cerebrum. We are not drawing cerebellum. This is the corpus callosum. So it used to separate two hemispheres, the right hemispheres and the left hemispheres. So they connect two cerebral hemispheres. So answer is option A. So next we will see the next question. The bony labyrinth of ear contains flow following. So labyrinth are bony labyrinth and membranous labyrinth. Bony labyrinth are fairy limbs. So we can say membranous labyrinth has endolymph. So answer is option A. Next we'll see the next question. Uh, layers in the walls of eyeball from inside to outside is given over here. Okay. Yes, let's see. So this is going to be the retina. So retina is present inside. And then there's going to be choroids. So choroids usually present. This is the let me draw it this way. So this is going to be the retina and then is going to be the choroid and then is going to be the sclera. So the last one is sclera and this is choroids and this is retina. So we can say retina, choroid and sclera. So it's option A. The correct logical sequence regarding flow of sound in human ear is, we can say it's going to be, what are the things that will be present? First, it goes through the auditory canal and then to eardom and then to the ear vessel uh, bones and then to the oval window and then to the cochlea. So answer is option B. Yes. So we have done with all the questions over here. So I hope everybody understood every question's detail. So what, what I would suggest you to keep revising for until you have your exams. All the best for all of you. Uh, keep revising. And very important thing is if you have any kind of questions, you can put your questions in the dialogue boxes. Okay. Yes, we'll get back to you. Yes. Thank you all of you. We'll meet in the next video. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for joining. We'll meet again. Yes, thank you so much.